term and our uh, series of CITC lunch and seminars. Uh, also, welcome back to uh, Professor Ed Felton, back from the White House, giving a talk Hi. on Monday afternoon. So, hope that many of you can make that. Um, today, uh, we have Catherine Hanschen, who is a fellow in CITC this year. Uh, she holds her PhD from the University of Texas, Austin, uh, where she's also currently a, a visiting scholar. Uh, she works in the area of journalism and communications, and particularly how digital media uh, affects political participation. And today she's going to talk about how to run new kinds of experiments on Facebook without Facebook's uh, 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 cooperation, I guess. Yes. Cool. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. So uh, as Nick just pointed out, I'm going to be talking to you today about how to run experiments. Uh, so we run experiments for a number of reasons, one of which is to show cause within the social sciences. We use experiments to delineate a cause and effect relationship. So uh, I'm going to go over how to do that, and I'm going to go into a bit of depth in case that is something any of you want to pursue as a method. And then I'm going to show you uh, some experiments that I ran on Facebook. Uh, so before we get into that, so why, why do I bother doing this with my time? <laughs> well, there's a lot of uh, scholars who talk about how the internet and social media generally uh, may have negative effects on society. Folks like uh, Putnam and Cass Sunstein, they talk about how internet use means people aren't going out and joining bowling teams anymore, and it means people can isolate themselves within uh, so-called filter bubbles or echo chambers and not be exposed to diverse and other ideas. There's also no shortage of uh, internet hot takes about how social media doesn't matter, so a lot of folks don't even think this is a worthy object of study. But if you look at survey research, you'll see a lot of evidence that internet and social media use are positively associated with political participation. So maybe doing all of this social media stuff could actually be good for society. So I'm going to talk to you today briefly about what, what constitutes an experiment methodologically. I'm going to talk about why we bother to do these uh, experiments in Facebook networks then talk about how to do an experiment in an existing Facebook network, like say you on your friends, and then give you some examples of some studies that follow this method. So uh, when we talk about an experiment in the social sciences where we are experimenting on people or human subjects basically, uh, we have two criteria that need to be met. The first is random assignment. Every person in an experiment needs to have an equal probability of being either in a treatment or a control group. So we can't just say, okay, you are all the treatment group and you are all the control group. That doesn't work because there might be some reason why all of you are sitting over there and all of you are sitting over there that could in turn bias the results of the experiment. So instead we have to randomly assign people to either treatment or control and then go ahead and apply some stimulus to the treatment group and do nothing to the control group such that any difference in the outcome variable is going to be attributed to the treatment itself and nothing else. So we do this to make causal claims. Experiments are what you use to say X causes Y. If people use Facebook more, then they will vote more. A relationship like that. You have to do the randomization and the assignment to treatment and measure the outcome to say definitively that something causes a change in an outcome. So why do we want to do this in networks? Because they are the dominant form of social organization. We live in networks. We have networks of friends, people we went to school with, people in our families. And these networks are increasingly manifested online, right? So with platforms such as Facebook. And we know from research into networks generally, not just online networks, that networks exert influence on what you know, what your opinions are, what issues you care about, and even how you behave. So studying networks has a really good potential to explain a lot of our everyday lived experiences. And what's important to think about with networks is that it's hard to isolate a behavior from the people in the network. So for instance, most of my friends read the newspaper every day. Most of my friends are also academics or work in government or work in politics. So there might be some underlying thing about my friends that explains both why we're friends and why they read the newspaper. We need to do an experiment to start untangling those things and understand if, for instance, 
uh, reading the newspaper is associated with some sort of outcome. So another reason to study uh, networks is the role of social norms. So social norms are really fascinating to me. They are essentially the unwritten rules that govern how people behave. So when we meet someone for the first time, we stick our hand out and we shake it. That's a social norm. These aren't necessarily written into law. They're just how we all know to behave. And they're created through a cycle of repetition and reward. So if I pick up a piece of trash and put it in the garbage, people say, oh, that's great. You know, you picked up some litter, that's awesome. Versus if I say, leave a message, uh, leave a mess in the sink, someone's gonna send an email and say, hey, you guys shouldn't do that, that's not good, right? And so we often think of these emotions as being referred to as either pride or shame in the sense that that's how we feel about how other people view or would hypothetically view our behaviors. And that's what helps people adhere to social norms. Um, generally speaking, the more visible your behavior is, the more likely you are to conform to social norms. And we can think of social norms as being either injunctive, which describe what you should do, or descriptive, which is what you see everyone around you doing. So for instance, uh, if you go into the dining hall, we know the injunctive norm of nutrition is that you should eat five servings of fruit and vegetables a day and you should drink eight glasses of water. Maybe when you go look at what people are actually eating, everyone is having pizza and drinking soda, right? And so both injunctive and descriptive norms are really powerful ways of shaping and influencing behavior and a lot of scholars study both of them. So we're gonna look a bit at how these social norms might function in Facebook networks. So why Facebook? It's the dominant social networking platform in America. There's 191 million monthly users in America alone. Uh, it's 68% of American adults, not just online adults, but all American adults, 68%. And we know from uh, survey research that the platform is an effective source of news exposure, especially when coming from people in our networks that we trust, like friends and family and that Facebook use itself is statistically related to an increase in political participation, social capital, uh, maintaining relationships, and even overall life satisfaction. So these are relationships that we know that Facebook use goes along with these things. So what I wanna do with these experiments is try and figure out how to actually use Facebook as a mechanism to increase some of these outcomes. Uh, now, I want to do these experiments in existing Facebook networks because these are verifiable relationships, right? So your Facebook friends are real people. They are the people on your soccer team or the people in your book club. This is different from, say, Twitter, when you can just sign up with an anonymous account and be like an egg or something like that. Facebook limits accounts to one per person. It has to, you have to have a real email, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a higher degree of verifiability of the people on Facebook in these networks. Also because we know from uh, scholars of digital media that Facebook makes our behaviors really visible, right? We go and we post a status update telling people what we had for lunch or showing people what we're doing over the weekend. And the members of the networks themselves are visible. So you can go to a friend's Facebook page and look to see who your friends are in common or maybe see who all of their Facebook friends are. You can look up someone you don't know on Facebook and see who your friends are in common. And that visibility and traversability of the network is going to be important for the studies we're gonna run. Now, there's a whole bunch of methodological challenges in conducting experiments on Facebook. So the first is it's a relatively closed platform, right? To use Facebook, you have to sign up for an account. You have to um, basically consent to their terms of service. They have control over the applications that run on the platform. They have a lot of purported ownership over the content and can potentially restrict access to the platform. Um, so that's a big issue just in terms of being able to get in and, and muck around and manipulate the experience on the platform. Uh, also, experiments in networks require the network itself to be mapped before starting. We need to know everybody who's in the network so we can assign treatment that way, rather than do something to people and then figure out afterwards who they were connected to in the network. Uh, we need some way to randomize the members of the network and some way to group them into our two conditions. And then we need some way to apply the treatment itself either on Facebook or potentially off Facebook. 
and finally measure the outcome variable. And as somebody who runs a lot of experiments, sometimes that how am I going to measure the outcome variable can be a little bit trickier than you think at the outset. So we need to make sure our uh, experiments meet all of these criteria. Just as a note on some past examples of experiments in Facebook networks, obviously the Facebook data science team does a number of them, but that is research done in conjunction with someone who works for Facebook. They have to agree to participate in your study if you reach out to them. And that means Facebook gets a heavy, uh, heavy amount of say in what studies are run on the platform. So I think as researchers, we need some way to do this, not with uh, Facebook's explicit consent or participation. Um, some of the past experiments on Facebook networks use fake mock-ups of Facebook, right, where they make illustrations of news feeds and manipulate content. But the people in those experiments know it's fake. It's obviously not Facebook. It's a fake Facebook. So I would argue that that doesn't necessarily come as close to understanding the relationships in real Facebook networks. Uh, some scholars were using apps that were built under previous iterations of the Facebook API. And those apps are no longer authorized to collect the network level information that the experiments relied on. So that's kind of out. Uh, and then there are plenty of folks who have conducted experiments that violate Facebook's <coughs> terms of service. And generally, as a researcher, I would argue against that. I, well, I, let's say the IRB would argue against that. So it may not be a good idea. And now some folks have started trying to assign Facebook users to do experiments on their friends. They say, okay, you two do something to your friends, you two do something to your friends. So my method goes beyond that and makes a substantial improvement on that by operationalizing the experiment within each individual network. So I'm going to explain why that matters. So first off, you can't randomly assign someone to a network. Like I can't say, okay, you go make friends with that guy and you make friends with that guy and then we'll experiment on you later, right? That's not how networks work. They are real sets of relationships between people. Also, we can't assign treatment at the network level because there might be something different about the individual networks. Here, the people in the treatment groups, these are smaller networks than the control group. So that would add a lot of uh, problematic aspects to the statistical power of the relationship and might bias the results. There might be some reason why this is a smaller network than this network. Also, so even if we fix that, right, we try and even out the assignment to control and treatment so they're roughly even. It's possible that one of the people doing the study is just weird and having that person and all of their friends in one group could bias the outcome. We need to distribute the variation of the people carrying out the studies across the treatment groups. And last but not least, we know that networks are overwhelmingly homogenous. So if we're going to assign at the level of the network, there might be a problem where these networks happen to be wealthier and this network happens to be older, right? So we get a lot of uh, covariate <coughs> variance in each of these networks that has the potential to bias the outcome of the study. So the better solution is to go to this person and randomly assign these people, this person randomly assign these people, et cetera, et cetera. So within each network, people are randomly assigned to one condition or the other. So how do we do this? So recruit people to carry out your studies in social science. They are known as confederates. And these confederates can go to their Facebook pages. Anyone can do this. This is your general account settings page. And on the bottom, there's a little link to download a copy of your Facebook data. And included in that is all of the pictures you've uploaded and the stuff you've put on Facebook. And one of the files is a list of all of your friends, your current friends, your former friends, the people you've unfriended, pending friend requests, it's all in there. For a lot of these experiments, you then need to take that list and match it to an external source of data, such as a public voter file or a list of phone numbers or however you plan to measure your outcome variable. You want to match the people first. Anyone who matches is then randomly assigned to a treatment or a control group. Now, in terms of grouping the subjects, I use Facebook's friend list feature, which is a setting that allows you to control who can see what posts. Uh, Facebook is already using this for you. So you already have friend lists for, I think, your high school and your college and your hometown or something like that. 
So you can create friend lists of your own and then restrict what you post to either only be visible to one group or not be visible to that group. So hypothetically, you could make a friend list of everyone on your dissertation committee and then just make sure they never see anything you post on Facebook so they don't know that you're goofing around on Facebook when you're supposed to be writing your dissertation, right? That is one practical application of this. So here we can see what it looks like. Create a new list, type the names of the people in you want in the treatment group and the control group, and then you see the list of the friends on your friend list page. Now in terms of the actual treatments itself, the experiments I do mostly use status updates. So here's an example of a status update with a voting reminder. It's tagging the subject of the experiment in it and it's visible only to the treatment group. So that way we know that the treatments can only be seen by people in the treatment group and the control group cannot see anything at all. And then we know any difference in the outcome is due to the treatment itself. And though most of my studies tag people in status updates, you can also direct, you can use the settings, the group settings, to change what people are exposed to in their news feed coming from the Confederate. Okay, so three studies using this method. The first one is a get out the vote study, testing the effect of tagging people in uh, Facebook messages, reminding them to go vote. The second one is what happens when bystanders or onlookers can see those messages tagging people or reminding them to vote. And the third is a pilot study that I ran over the summer that I'm working on developing and replicating about what happens when you share news <laughs> on Facebook. So this study uh, was conducted, the first study was conducted in Dallas in the 2014 general election. As an aside, I actually did this study on my own friends the year before uh, and it worked. They voted, but my advisors thought, well, maybe, you know, you're weird and your friends are weird. I don't know if it's a thing. So I ran the exact same study again, recruiting seven people to do it on their friends, thinking that if it worked, then maybe it's a thing. Maybe it's not just that me and my friends are weird. So I had seven Confederates recruited from an organization in Dallas. I matched their friend lists to the public voter file for the county and used what's called social pressure messaging, which comes out of political science. These are voting reminders that emphasize that the voter file is public. Um, we don't know who you voted for, but we know if you voted or not. And they often attempt to make people either feel pride for voting in the past or shame for missing an election or just tell people to do their civic duty. So I used those four treatment conditions and measured the outcome using the public voter file for the county. So we had just under 300 people in the experiment who were friends with one and only one Confederate. It was a pretty diverse sample, uh, pretty close to uh, reasonably evenly split. And I wanna note here that the average age was uh, almost 47 years old. So this is being done on, and it, it ranged, the subjects ranged from I think 18 or 19 to like 90. So this isn't just something I'm doing on a bunch of kids. This was done on a really diverse sample in terms of age. So this is an example of what these treatment look, look like. And I'll note that this was from the experiment I ran on my own friends due to privacy uh, rules. I can't show you the pictures of the Confederates carrying this out on their friends. So this is what these treatments look like. Voting records are public thanks to, here I tagged a bunch of my friends for voting, reminder to vote, and then a list of locations. And we can see six people got tagged and they are all going, they're liking it. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a good voter, right? This is what's known as a pride treatment or a praise treatment because people are being praised for voting. The ones for shame, they called people out and said, voting records are public, tagged a bunch of people and then said, none of you have voted in the current election, go vote. So that was the gist of what the treatments looked like. And we can think about how as far as experimental treatments go, they got tagged in a post so it would have showed up in their newsfeed. They would have gotten a notification and an email from Facebook that they were tagged in a post, right? So it's a pretty solid intervention. I'm pretty confident that people were aware of the treatments themselves. So we see in the Dallas County study that it did work. Uh, the messages praising people for voting increased turnout by over 9% and the message is shaming people for failing to vote yet increased turnout by over 21%. So 
in the get out the vote world, that's a really huge effect. Most experiments produce maybe a five or an eight percent increase in turnout. So something that increases turnout by almost 22 percent <coughs> over the control uh, in terms of a percentage point increase, that is a huge effect. So we see from this study that Facebook posts can actually increase turnout through praising or shaming uh, one's friends for their past voter participation. And it works because the posts heighten the subject's perceived visibility of their voting behavior, right? When you get tagged in a Facebook post by your friend, they're basically calling you out in front of everybody you know who can see that post and everybody they know who can see that post, right? So we, believe, we know from research on norms that if you heighten visibility of behavior, conformity should increase. Uh, so this was such a big effect, I was curious if it worked on bystanders. So maybe Nick here sees me shaming Philip, and I'm like, oh, Philip, you haven't voted. And Nick's like, oh my god, I have to go vote, or I'm going to get tagged in one of these status messages, right? That's what I wondered. So I ran that experiment, too. And this time had eight Confederates uh, recruited from a local political organization. Again, ran this in uh, 2014 in a general election. Used the same treatment, except this time the Confederates tagged each other rather than tagging their friends. And again, measured the outcome using the voter file. We had over 670 people in the study who were friends with the Confederate. Again, the age, you know, the average was about 34 years old. So people in this one, again, ranged from about 18 years old up into their 70s and 80s. So relatively diverse sample in terms of age. So the way the manipulation worked was the Confederates tagged each other. Right, they, they basically went around, the, went around the horn and tagged a different person each day. And the messages were visible to different treatment groups. So the folks in civic duty saw people get reminded in civic duty messages. The folks in the pride condition saw people be praised for voting in this election. And the people in the shame group saw people be shamed for failing to vote. So if you're the subject, right, your experience of this is you're scrolling through Facebook and there's a picture of your friend's cat, and there's a picture of your friend's lunch, and in between is your friend calling someone out for not having voted yet, or praising them for having voted. That's the manipulation. So it's not as intensive. We don't know if the people saw the treatment. The subjects were never directly tagged. So did it work? The answer is kind of. Uh, we found there was a statistically significant increase in turnout in people with uh, new or infrequent voter history, people who had never voted before or only voted one or two times in a general election. The people who saw the pride treatments praising other people for voting, that increased turnout by 11%. There was no impact on habitual voters. Habitual voters appear unmoved <coughs> by seeing other people praise and shame their friends for their voting behaviors. But it did work for the pride condition. Uh, and one thing I want to note is that this shows the importance of being able to do these experiments at the individual level because the moderating relationship here is an individual level variable, each person's prior voter history. So if we had done this experiment, randomized uh, and analyzed it just at the group level, there is not a significant effect. It's a moderating relationship that requires experimentation on the individual level. So why do I think this worked? Because the posts praising other people for voting created basically a fake descriptive norm that people were voting, right? So the treatments give this sense that everyone is voting. Oh, I see people are voting, I should vote too. I like to think of it as FOMO for voting, right? Like, you don't want to miss out. And it actually follows past research on descriptive norms and voter turnout, which show that if you tell people turnout is high, whether or not it is, they will vote more, right? So one solution here to challenges in low voter turnout is we can just go on Facebook and give the impression that everybody is voting, and it will actually help new and infrequent voters get out to vote. And this is a specific Facebook thing, right? It, it leverages Facebook's ability to make uh, your behavior visible in networks because you're seeing someone else tag someone else about voting. Uh, it's also easier to operationalize. 
it's actually quite hard to recruit people to praise and shame their Facebook friends in the name of science, but it's not as difficult to get people to put messages up tagging people who are in on the game, encouraging them to go vote. So I ran another study over the summer. I wanted to look at exposure to other kind of messages and what they might, um, what impact they might have. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to talk about that or should I just wait for the Q&A? Um, I'm going to ask you to wait till the oh, okay. Q&A if that's okay. Thanks. So I ran this study over the summer, uh, recruited six friends from my personal network, and the treatments were sharing a series of news articles about raising the minimum wage. So I took their network, <laughs> matched them to phone lists, I had them give me the names of their Facebook friends and then had the rest matched by a commercial vendor. And anyone we had a phone number on was enrolled in the study. <coughs> so a third of the people were in the control group, a third saw the article framed in a neutral manner, and a third saw the articles framed in support of raising the minimum wage. Then after all of this treatment went on, uh, we did a telephone survey and asked them about the issue of raising the minimum wage. So there were 960 some people who were exposed to the news articles or in the control group, and we were able to survey 113. So that's not a terrible response rate for a telephone poll in this day and age. However, it did mean we didn't get as many uh, subjects in the study as we needed. Uh, the sample skewed female, like the, most of the Confederates were female and their friend networks were overwhelmingly female, so not a huge surprise. An average age, 43. One issue with the study was that the sample ended up being uh, over 66% self-identified Democratic voters. So if and when, when I run the study again, uh, I do need a more diverse sample uh, to see if that's a good sign. So here's an example of what these treatments look like. I found 10 news articles about raising the minimum wage. Some were in favor, some were against, some didn't have an opinion whatsoever. And the difference was how the articles themselves were framed. So in the neutral framing, it was very explanatory for both the pro and con and you know, just saying, hey, here's something to look at. The positive framing, what the language the Confederate used was heavily in favor of raising the minimum wage no matter what the article said. So if the article was against it, the framing language was, this article is wrong, we should raise the wage, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how that looked. So we see that amongst folks in both treatment conditions, their awareness of the issue increased by 5%. And we see that in the positive framing, their support for raising the minimum wage increased by 3% over, over the control group and was also higher than the neutral framing group. The problem is I did not have enough people in my study for these results to be statistically significant. So I, am, uh, I was not able to definitively say whether or not this produces an effect. But the evidence does suggest that sharing news increases issue awareness. It increases the salience of an issue within a network. And the framing language has an impact on people's attitudes towards that issue. Uh, so I am planning to replicate this with more Confederates and uh, do multiple survey attempts to get more responses till I know for sure if this is a thing or not. So in terms of the method, I think this has a number of strengths. Uh, the first is that uh, field experiments are supposed to be done in as close to a naturalistic setting as possible. So here we're actually experimenting in Facebook networks with actual people, not in a mock-up or in some sort of fake scenario. Uh, and of course, Facebook as the most widely used social networking platform, I think is a really important place to be doing research. Uh, these experiments have strong external validity, which means that the results should hold true no matter who is applying them, right? These studies should work no matter who is doing the treatment on their friends. And I like that they have some positive application to some major problems. You know, we have terrible voter turnout, especially in local races and in anything other than presidential elections. So I think this is one way to solve that problem. Uh, however, there are a number of issues here. Uh, the biggest one is that your statistical power, which is contingent on the <coughs> number of people in your study, is in this instant contingent on the number of friends your Confederates have who you can match. So if you can't recruit enough Confederates to carry out this study, or they don't have enough friends, you're not going to have enough people to detect an effect if there is one. 
It also relies on the Confederates to behave. So if they quit in the middle, or they don't do the treatments correctly, or they tell their friends it's an experiment and they should ignore it, right? that can ruin the study. Uh, the matching of Facebook friend lists, where you basically just get a name to an external source of data, can be difficult or impossible. Um, in terms of matching to the voter file, I've used full name and asked the Confederates to collect birth dates and city and state for me, which is usually enough to make a match. But there's more than one Bob Smith in Dallas County, turns out. So you can't always be sure that you found the correct person. Uh, and in the case of the phone study, we were not able to get phone numbers. The, the news sharing study, we weren't able to get phone numbers on everybody. Uh, and then a lot of the phone numbers we got were bad. So that made it difficult to poll people. Uh, from an ethical perspective, these studies meddle in real relationships. And so that's something the Confederates have to be comfortable with. And I should note it's possible that people who are doing this to their friends may be different than people who refuse to. So there may be an issue of people who are willing to make their friends social science experiment subjects may be fundamentally different than people who won't. And that may bias the results as well. Uh, and finally, there are questions about some of the outcome variables. Uh, I haven't had a study yet produce a decrease in turnout. But it's possible that some of the manipulations one could study in a network might increase unfriending or might suppress voter turnout or uh, decrease tolerance or things like that. So that's a challenge that researchers have to engage with before setting out on this. Uh, in terms of the theoretical contributions, we see that opinions and behaviors circulate in online networks, just as we already know they do in offline networks. Uh, and we know that we can see that Facebook posts can actually cause an increase in voting when you use this social pressure messaging, and that sharing news may actually have an effect on opinions and issue awareness. So to wrap up, networks are the dominant form of social life. We should do experiments in them, especially on Facebook, because everyone is using it. And so far, I have managed to show that uh, voting behaviors circulate in Facebook networks. And the reminding people to vote is powerful enough to work even on onlookers. And that it looks like news sharing may heavily influence awareness of issues and opinions. So that's it. And I look forward to your questions.